Hello friends, in this session we are going to see about uh, one of the long cases in forensic medicine particles that is uh, sex determination from the cluster of bones. So, in the exam generally you will be given a skull, a pelvis and a uh, femur. So, you have to determine the sex and the other parameters which are medically important that is a race, a stature, cause of death, time since death. Uh, origin human or animal bone like that. So, in this session we are going to see mainly the uh, sex differentiating features between the male and the female bones. According to Krogman, the accuracy of sexing when the entire skeleton is provided is 100 percent that is uh, with 100 percent certainty we can exactly tell whether it is male or female skeleton. Suppose uh, individual bones alone are available then the accuracy differs. Uh, among the individual bones, the pelvis has the highest uh, accuracy of sexing. That is according to Krogman, for pelvis it is a 95 percent accuracy. That means, the 100 pelvis are given and the 95 percent of pelvis we can exactly determine the sex. Remaining 5 percent, there will be ambiguity. That is, we cannot exactly determine the sex due to intermingling of sexual features in the same bone. Then in that situation, we have to rely on the other bones like skull, femur, etc. to arrive at the sex. Next uh, reliable bone after pelvis is the skull, which uh, uh, has 90 percent accuracy. Then the long bone, especially the femur that has 80 percent accuracy of sexing. Suppose uh, the pelvis and the skull is uh, together given, then the accuracy rises to 98 percent. Similarly, is pelvis and uh, femur that also accuracy rises to 98 percent. Okay. So, this is Krogman's uh, K R O G M A N, Krogman's uh, accuracy of sexing. Now, let us move on to uh, sexual differences in the skull. The sexual differences in the skull are mostly non metric. So, we have to rely on more mostly morphological features which are subjective. Okay. So, left one I am carrying is the male skull, on the right hand is the uh, female skull. Generally, the male skull is uh, as you are seeing is uh, relatively larger, it is heavier and uh, massive. This uh, holds for uh, other bones also like femur, pelvis, generally male bones are bigger in size and heavier uh, bones are there because of uh, larger size and the bone density also higher. Now, coming to uh, this uh, skull, overall as I told uh, the size is uh, larger. If you measure the intracranial capacity or endocranial volume, it comes around uh, 1500 cc, whereas female skull is uh, relatively smaller with the intracranial capacity is 10 percent lesser compared to male that is a 1350 cc. If you compare the walls of the skull they are thicker here in female it is thinner. Then if you see the shape you know it is more longer that means uh, it is a dolichocranium whereas uh, female skull is more uh, rounded and short, okay. smaller and rounded that is called a brachycranium, brachycranium. Coming to architecture, if you see the surface especially over the temporal and uh, occipital regions, muscular markings that is a uh, bony ridges where the muscles are attached, they are more pronounced because in males generally the muscles are stronger. So, muscular ridges are more prominent in the all the male bones which is more noticed in the temporal and uh, occipital regions and of course, in the basal regions of the skull also. Because in males the masseter and the temporalis are stronger compared to females. So, it is surface is uneven that is called a rugged architecture R U W G E T rugged architecture in uh, males. Whereas, in female if you see the same temporal and occipital regions they are more smoother muscular markings are not much pronounced here. Now, let us see the individual uh, features. Let us begin with the forehead contour. Forehead in the male skull as you are seeing here, it is a steeper, this is it is receding backwards. 
whereas in the female skull it is more vertical if you compare the male with the female it is a steeper in male whereas on the right side on the right hand it is a vertical it is round full and infantile that is important discriminant then comes the supra orbital ridges okay where our uh, this uh, above the orbits uh, this is the supra orbital ridges eyebrows are there they are more pronounced more projected anteriorly in the male skull whereas in the female skull you are seeing supra orbital ridges are not prominent it is otherwise called a supra ciliary arch also this supra orbital ridges more pronounced then the point between the eyebrows called a glabella g l a b e l l a glabella again it is more protruded forwards in male skull again if you see from side it is more projected ventrally it is more prominent whereas in the female skull it is not so prominent okay it is small or uh, you can say it is less prominent okay so these are all important features glabella supra orbital ridges then comes the nasion that is the fronto nasal junction okay where our uh, bridge of the spectacle re rests on the face that is the nasion or fronto nasal junction in the male skull there you can see a distinct angulation it abruptly goes inwards whereas in female skull if you compare it is smoothly curved okay the nasion is smoothly curved that is also important and useful discriminant now comes to the orbit as you are seeing here the male orbit is a square shape it is relatively uh, smaller in size smaller means uh, with respect to overall facial profile okay with overall facial profile of skull if we compare with the female the size is relatively smaller it rests lower on the face it is situated lower on the face and if you slide your fingers along the supra orbital margin especially the lateral part of supra orbital margin it is more rounded and smooth whereas in the female skull it is more shape is more rounded and it is relatively larger in size compared to overall facial profile it is positioned higher in the face position is higher and if you slide your finger on the lateral orbital rim it is more sharper okay it is thinner and sharper you can easily feel this spot that uh, that is about uh, orbits now comes to the nasal aperture the male the nasal aperture is uh, higher it is narrower the margins are sharper since the orbits are positioned lower this nasal aperture assumes a higher position in the male skull if you compare with the female skull the nasal aperture is positioned lower because orbits are positioned relatively higher in the face then it is relatively broader and the margins are more rounded then comes the teeth teeth generally male teeth are larger compared to female teeth and if you see the cusp of especially the first molar that is a male often have five cusps whereas in the female the first molar often have four four cusps only that is not so important i come to mandible later now let us see the shape of the palate the palate is larger more rounded okay like this in male skull whereas in the female skull the palate is relatively smaller and it is called a parabola shape okay it is not uh, rounded like inverted u shape like here it is a more of parabola shape okay the anterior part is narrowed here it will be like this that is important discriminant so far in the front we have seen forehead supraorbital ridges uh, glabella nasion orbits uh, nasal aperture teeth etc and palate for convenience uh, we are going in this direction first to finish the from anterior part then come to side and then we will proceed with the posterior part so that you won't miss any features okay in the exam also you can follow the same principle now coming to side 
this is the zygoma bone this is a zygomatic process called they are together called a cheek bone the zygoma if you uh, see in the male it is a uh, broader and a uh, larger it is more thicker whereas the zygoma part is relatively smaller and thinner lighter here in the female skull if you see the zygomatic arch or zygomatic process in the male it is more broader thicker and uh, it is larger in size and the lateral arching is more pronounced importantly the lateral arching or the outward bulging is more in the male skull compared whereas in the female skull zygomatic process is relatively smaller thinner and uh, the lateral arching is lesser okay it is not so bulging laterally it is more compressed here in the female skull then comes the bony ridge above the external auditory meatus otherwise called a supramatal crest supramatal m e a t a l meatal crest c r e s t that is nothing but the bony ridge above the external auditory meatus in the male skull it will be present whereas in the female skull that bony ridge often won't be present this uh, supramatal crest is nothing but the extension of the posterior edge of the zygomatic process it uh, continues as a ridge much past the external auditory meatus up to here generally in the male skull whereas in the female skull the zygomatic process generally ends in front of the external auditory meatus it doesn't cross cross the external auditory meatus in all, but in all skulls uh, this feature won't uh, match now comes the important discriminant that is the mastoid process as you are seeing here the mastoid process in the male is larger and the tip is blunt whereas compared comparatively in the female the mastoid process is uh, smaller and the tip of the mastoid process is uh, pointed here that is important discriminant mastoid process then comes just uh, medial to mastoid process there will be a group where the posterior belly of digastric muscle originates here okay that is called a digastric group in male the group is more deeper whereas in the female skull the digastric group just immediately medial to this uh, mastoid process in female it is uh, relatively shallow okay it is relatively less deep and uh, that is a uh, shallow here so that's all and the side uh, things the zygomatic process uh, supramatal crest mastoid and a digastric group now coming to posterior part we see the external occipital protuberance okay that is protuberance uh, that is not uh, protuberance p r o t u b e r a n c okay external occipital protuberance in the male skull as you are seeing it is more prominent whereas in the female skull it is more rounded it is not prominent and the area also the muscular markings are less pronounced giving a smooth appearance to the architecture then comes the foramen magnum in the male skull foramen magnum as you are seeing here is a relatively larger and it is oblong whereas in the female skull the foramen magnum is relatively smaller and it is more rounded on either side of the foramen magnum you can see the two projections they are called uh, occipital condyles condyles as a whole whereas the articulating part of this condyle is called a uh, condyle or facet the surface is facet as a whole condyles condyles if you compare the size in male it is larger whereas in the female skull the condyles are smaller if you see the condyle or facet part in the male it is longer and uh, slender it is more longer and uh, slender or leaner okay whereas in a uh, female the condylar facet as you are seeing here is uh, shorter and uh, more broader with this more broad compared to female male skull okay then this basal foramina they are all relatively bigger in male skull whereas basal foramina are smaller in female skull that is not so important then other features you can write like uh, frontal eminences 
these are all frontal eminence and these two are parietal eminences. They are relatively less prominent in male skull whereas, these are frontal and the parietal eminences they are more prominent in the female skull. Then these are sinuses, frontal sinuses and uh, these maxillary sinuses, frontal sinuses, the x-ray. Frontal sinuses are very more developed in the male skull, it is less developed in the female skull. Similarly, maxillary sinuses also larger in male skull, whereas in the female skull it is uh, relatively smaller. That is a x-ray finding. So, overall we have covered all the salient features in the skull bone. Now, coming to mandible. Mandible also we cannot skip. In the exam, uh, you are supposed to write about mandible features also. Like uh, all other bones, male mandible. This is the left hand is the male mandible, on the right side is the right hand is the female mandible. Male mandible generally larger, massive, thicker, whereas female is relatively smaller, thinner, and lighter. Okay. Then let us see the individual features. First, shape of chin. For uh, the shape of chin, you have to hold the mandible upside down and uh, show the examiner the anterior part. Okay. It is chin is a square shape. You know, it is going like this. Take the bend horizontal, then it is going like this, giving a square shaped chin. Okay. Whereas in female. If we compare with the male, the shape of chin is more rounded. The mental tubercles are more prominent in male skull, male mandible, whereas in the female, mental tubercles are not so prominent. That is why we get the square shaped chin. Then, body height at the symphysis menti that is higher in the male mandible, whereas in the female mandible, body height is lesser here. Okay, at the central part. Then comes the, uh, this angle of mandible. Angle of mandible, that is the lower border of body of uh, mandible and the posterior border of ascending ramus. Okay, that the intersecting point is the angle of mandible, otherwise called a gonial angle or anatomical angle. Okay. It is everted, it is coming outwards, whereas in the female mandible, it is not everted or often straight, okay. straight or not everted in the female. If you measure the angle, in the male, it is, since it is somewhat more vertical, more straight upwards, the angle is less obtuse, under 125 degree. Whereas, in the female, since it is relatively more slanting backwards, the angle is more obtuse, more than 125 degree. Okay. Whereas, the upper part of angle is called a medicolingual angle. Okay. Upper part of uh, uh, this uh, body and the, this uh, upper border of body and the anterior border of this uh, ramus, where the intersect is called a medicolingual angle. That is useful for assessing the age. The infants and the old age, it is more obtuse, about 140 degree, whereas in the adults, it is about 90 degree, it is more vertical, 90 degree. It can be remembered by the mnemonic MAS, M A A S, that is M for medical legal angle, second letter A for age, third letter A for anatomical angle, S for sex. Okay. This is for sex, this is for assess the age, this is helpful for your MCQ. If you see the as breadth of the ascending ramus in the male mandible, the breadth is more. Whereas, if you compare here, the ascending ramus breadth is relatively lesser. That is important discriminant. Again, in the male mandible, if you see the posterior border of ascending ramus, there will be an indentation corresponding to the level of occlusional surface of the molars. You can see the indentation here. Whereas, the female, it is straight, there is no such indentation. Then comes the condyles, this is the condylar process, this is the coronoid process. Condyles, the male mandible, the size is larger, 
whereas in the female mandible the condyles are relatively smaller. So these are all the important features pertaining to mandible. Most important is the shape of uh, chin and uh, breadth of ascending ramus and the angle of mandible, agonian angle everted, uh, all this. So with this we have completed skull. Next uh, let me move on to another important bone which has the highest reliability with 95 percent accuracy that is the human pelvis. On my left hand is the male pelvis, on my right hand is the female pelvis. Generally male pelvis again is a relatively heavier, robust whereas uh, it is more lighter female pelvis. If we compare the bony framework, overall if you see the ilium, na, ilium reaches a higher level, it is more vertical giving a somewhat a conical shape okay? or conical shaped uh, pelvis. Whereas or deep funnel otherwise called a deep funnel shaped pelvis okay? because of higher vertical smaller outlet all this. Whereas the female pelvis if you compare the ilium part, ilium is at lower level compared to male pelvis, it is flaring outwards, it is more laterally divergent giving a flat bowl shape, okay? flat bowl shape is the female pelvis because of uh, larger outlet all this. Since the ilium is more vertical and higher in the male pelvis, the anterior surface of the ilium called the iliac fossa that is more deeper in the male pelvis. Since the female the ilium blades are flaring outwards, the anterior surface iliac fossa is uh, shallower. Okay? Now, after ilium, let us see the uh, pelvic brim and the line along the pelvic brim, brim called a iliopectineal line. Iliopectineal line in the male pelvis, this is the iliopectineal line running along the brim. It is more it is rough and uh, more prominent. Whereas in the female, the iliopectineal line is uh, relatively smoother, it is smoother in uh, architecture. Now shape of the pelvic inlet, in the male it is hard shape because the sacral pomantry is more projected ventrally, it gives a hot and shaped pelvic inlet. Whereas in female it is more circular or elliptical shape. Then comes the true pelvis or pelvic cavity, below the inlet is the true pelvis or pelvic cavity over that is the false pelvis. In male it is conical or funnel shape, okay? it is narrow here, whereas it is broad and round, it is more broad and round the true pelvis part in female pelvis. If we compare the outlet, again it is a size is smaller in male pelvis whereas the outlet size is larger in female pelvis. This is uh, designed for the purpose of parturition. Okay? The female pelvis is modified for the purpose of delivery. That is why these uh, features are more marked between male and female pelvis. That is why the pelvis has the higher reliability compared to other bones. Now comes the pubis symphysis. Pubis symphysis reaches a higher level in the male pelvis whereas pubic symphysis reaches the lower level in the female pelvis. If you see the body of pubis in the male it is a smaller triangular in shape. If you compare with the female pelvis the body is relatively larger and it is more square shape okay? somewhat square or even rectangular. It is relatively larger eh, as you can compare easily see. Then comes the obturator foramen. In male, the obturator foramen is larger with the base of the oval shape upwards. Okay? Base is resting upwards, giving a oval shape and relatively larger in size. Whereas in female, if you see the size, it is relatively smaller 
and it is triangular shape as you are seeing here clearly triangular shape with the apex of the triangle facing anteriorly or forwards okay this is the point of apex of triangle after that of foramen if you see the descending ramus or inferior ramus of uh, pubis it uh, continues like the uh, body of pubis okay it is flat and uh, it is like continuation of body of pubis okay it is broader here whereas if you compare with the female the female the dis the descending ramus is narrowed or constricted here where the apex of the obturator foramen that part na no, where this apex lies that assume that gives you a narrowed or constricted appearance to the inferior ramus of pubis in the female pelvis in the male that the pubic arch that the medial margin of the pubic arch this part okay it is more everted it is more laterally it is uh, everted here whereas in the female the medial margin of the pubic arch that is less everted here also everted but less everted if we compare overall the ischio pubic ramus entire ischio pubic ramus if you compare the male skull it is uh, less everted whereas in the female skull the entire ischio pubic ramus is uh, more everted then comes the subpubic angle if we make a or a line a straight line along the inner border of both ischio pubic ramus where they intersect upwards that gives the subpubic angle in male it is a, as you are seeing it is a somewhat a v inverted v shape it is narrow so angle is if we measure lies between 70 to 75 degree whereas in the female since uh, the subpubic angle is a inverted u shape okay as you are seeing inverted u shape and a broader area here the angle is 90 to 100 degree subpubic angle is 90 to 100 that is important discriminant where from the even from the distance you can make out whether it is male or uh, female pelvis okay on the right side is the right hand is the female left side compare this subpubic angle coming to subpubic contour immediately below the body of pubis in the male if you compare the area it is straight okay it is straight whereas in the female pelvis the subpubic contour immediately below the body of pubis you can see the convex convex concavity okay subpubic concavity on the other side this area that is important and a useful feature now comes the ischial tuberosity in male it is inverted whereas that ischial tuberosity part is everted in the female it is everted now comes the acetabulum acetabulum in male it is relatively larger if you measure the diameter here if you measure the diameter here it comes around 52 mm whereas in female the acetabulum is uh, smaller and if you measure the diameter it comes around uh, 46 mm in male the acetabulum is directed more laterally whereas the female it is called a uh, anterolateral okay now comes the greater sciatic notch very very important and useful feature it is said to be one of the best single criterion for determining sex okay this is the greater sciatic notch in male as you are seeing here it is smaller narrower and deeper if you fix your tip of tongue uh, this uh, thumb here in the groove it fits tightly it doesn't there is it doesn't allow the thumb to wriggle freely okay there is no space here whereas in the female if we compare the greater sciatic notch it is a larger it is wider it is a shallower if you put your th thumb here you can see uh, there is enough space for wriggling here okay this is called otherwise called a thumb test it is a important discriminant because 
most of these uh, sex differentiating features between male and uh, female bones appear usually after puberty whereas this greater sciatic notch the differences you can make out even from the fetal life so in determining the sex of the fetus pertaining to pelvis most reliable feature is the greater sciatic notch even in fetuses infants it will be narrow in male pelvis and deep in male pelvis whereas uh, shallow and broader in the female pelvis now comes to the another important feature examiner often ask you is the pre auricular sulcus the area just lateral to the sacroiliac joint that is called a pre auricular sulcus the ligament attaches there also you should know that is called the anterior sacroiliac ligament in the female pelvis we can easily appreciate this uh, pre auricular sulcus just lateral to sacroiliac joint in this uh, pelvis you can say it is almost a little finger breadth huh? generally in female pelvis only they are frequent so it is broader generally deeper in the female pelvis whereas in the male pelvis this generally infrequent even if it is present it is very narrow and shallow not very broad and deeper pre auricular sulcus in the female pelvis why it is so is especially in those parents women who have born children due to continuous stress or and attraction on that anterior sacroiliac ligament due to descent of the fetal head there is a much pull on that sulcus giving a broad and a deeper sulcus in the female especially multiparous woman another feature which may be useful to find out the paras from the aliparous woman is the depressions on the posterior part of the pubis on the posterior surface of body of pubis there may be depressions they are called a parturition pits or parturition scars they are present in the multiparous woman whereas in the aliparous woman it won't be there okay in the female pelvis in the posterior part called a parturition pits so the overall we have covered uh, all the important features in the male and the female pelvis as i already told female pelvis is designed for purpose of delivery this uh, both this ischial tuberosities are pulled both uh, forwards and uh, laterally because of that this uh, ischial tuberosities are everted subpubic angle becomes wider ischial pubic ramus becomes uh, everted in uh, more in females that uh, narrow triangular body of pubis becomes uh, broader and uh, square shape obturator foramen which is oval in male becomes a triangular because of both forward and uh, lateral pulling and the greater sciatic also notch also becomes more widened uh, and the outlet two pelvis all become bigger in size if we understand this concept we can easily write all these features and the subpubic angle also becomes wider so that's all about uh, female pelvis now coming to sacrum this one on the left hand is the male sacrum this one is the female sacrum male sacrum as you are seeing it is longer narrower often have five or even six sacral vertebra whereas the female sacrum is relatively shorter broader somewhat triangular shape usually maximum five vertebra only this is the body of s1 these are all alar process if we compare the breadth of body of s1 with the breadth of each alar in the male the breadth is somewhat more compared to breadth of each alar whereas in the female the breadth is uh, somewhat lesser compared to breadth of each alar the sacral pomant that uh, that uh, ventral projection part of body of s1 and the superior part that is more projected ventrally in the male sacrum whereas in the female it is less projected ventrally this is the sacral pomant if we compare the overall that anterior curvature of sacrum from the side if we see from s1 to s5 that in male it has a uniform curvature 
whereas in the female upper tone of sacral vertebra the anterior curvature is straight whereas in the lower tone of sacral vertebra they abruptly curved forwards upper of straight lower of abruptly curved forwards that is uh, called the anterior curvature of sacrum which is a uh, very important then comes the sacroiliac articulation in the male it extends up to toned off to third sacral vertebra whereas in the female the sacroiliac articulation surface extends up to two to toned off vertebra only then comes the coccyx part in coccyx in the male it is less movable in the female it is more movable so these are all the main features of the sacrum the sex differences in the pelvis is both non metric and metric now let us we have seen so far the non metric features let us see some metric features there are four indices we have to know first is ischio pubic index otherwise called a washburn index w a s h b u r n washburn or ischio pubic index that is nothing but pubic length in millimeter divided by ischio length in millimeter multiplied by 100 how to measure the pubic length is from the acetabular notch which is the reference point the depression in the acetabulum where three nominate bones that is ilium is came and pubis they will fuse that is the acetabular notch from that measure the distal most point on the body of pubis that gives the pubic length from the same point measure the distal most point on the ischial tuberosity that gives the length of ischium so length of pubis length of ischium the division multiplied by 100 in the male it is 73 to 94 in the female 91 to 115 that is the range why in the female it is higher is the body length of uh, this pubis no? length of pubis is higher more in females next uh, useful index is the sciatic notch index it is calculated by uh, that is uh, uh, width of the sciatic notch this is the point uh, between where we have to measure the width of greater sciatic notch and uh, from the deep most point in the groove make a straight line where they intersect uh, that line you know that is called, that provides the depth of sciatic notch width of sciatic notch uh, divided by depth of sciatic notch multiplied by 100 that is called a greater sciatic notch Sci- simply called a sciatic notch index in male in fetuses it is a uh, 4 to 5 whereas in the female the range is 5 to 6 okay width by depth width is more in female so the value also higher in females 4 to 5 5 to 6 that is pertaining to only pelvis of fetuses whereas for adult pelvis it is uh, the range is in the male it is uh, 145 the value is uh, 145 whereas uh, 166 in the adult pelvis 145 166 is for adults these are all the main indices coming to sacrum here also two indices are there one is a corpora basal index of the sacrum that is measured by breadth of body of s1 this is the maximum breadth of body of s1 divided by transverse diameter or breadth of base of sacrum okay the first s1 you know lateral most point that gives the breadth of base of sacrum or transverse diameter of base of sacrum breadth of body of s1 divided by breadth of base of sacrum into 100 that is called a corpora basal index the male it is more than 42 the female it is less than 42 okay because the breadth of body of s1 is as i already said it is more in male sacrum another index is the sacral index okay transverse diameter of base of sacrum divided by anterior length of sacrum from sacral bomanti to uh, lower border of s5 into 100 that gives the sacral index in the male it is less than 114 whereas in the female it is more than 114 why it is so is male sacrum is longer and narrower so with, with this we have completed the pelvis with the sacrum and lastly uh, lastly we will conclude with the uh, femur
here most of the sexual differences are metric based measurement based so that is more objective then uh, subjective based uh, skull features on the left hand is the male uh, femur on my right hand is the uh, female femur okay as you see here the male femur is uh, larger uh, longer and it is more massive whereas female is smaller height is lesser and it is lighter in the exam only one femur will be given you cannot differentiate whether it is massive or lighter unless you have already experienced with both the hands okay holding both the femurs so with the close eyes you can easily make out if it is heavier and mass massive you know it is a male femur it is lighter means it is a female femur now coming to this part head of the femur the male femur the head if you compare the size it is bigger whereas in the female it is smaller vertical diameter if you measure it comes around uh, uh, this uh, more than 47 mm whereas in female it is less than 45 mm vertical diameter the cut off range we can keep it as 45.5 above 45.5 more specific it is male less than 45.5 mm it is female the articulating part forms more than 2/3 of the sphere okay the articulating surface forms uh, more than 2/3 of the sphere if you fit it in the acetabulum whereas in the female the articulating surface forms less than 2/3 of the sphere then comes the neck shaft angle draw a line along the middle of the neck portion then draw a straight line along the middle of the shaft of the femur where the intersect provides the neck shaft angle this is the male in the male since it is more upright it is more obtuse more than 125 degree in the female it is less than 125 degree less obtuse both are obtuse it is more obtuse it is less obtuse that's all then comes the bicondyla width this is the condyle part this is the epicondyle part the distance between the both epicondyles if you measure with the vernier caliper that provides the that bicondyle art width in male the this are the size is bigger so it is 74 to 89 mm whereas in female the value ranges between 67 to 76 67 to 76 in female 74 to 89 in male then comes the angle of the shaft with the condyle as you are seeing here which one is uh, more straighter the male is more straight whereas uh, it is uh, slightly slanting laterally the female femur is slightly tilting laterally okay so if we measure the angle of the shaft with the condyle draw a straight line along the shaft and uh, where the angle forms with the base or floor you know that angle is called uh, next uh, this uh, angle of shaft with condyle since it is more upright the angle is uh, higher 80 degree not the inner angle i am telling about outer angle okay outer deviation whereas the female since it is more tilted laterally as you are seeing the angle is if you measure the outer angle it is lesser it is 76 degree okay it is upright 80 it is more slanting 76 degree 4 degree difference will be there and uh, you are seeing here the shaft 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 of the femur is more upright and straight whereas the female slight bowing you can see slight laterally lateral curving you can see in the female pelvis why all this because of the female pelvis is more wider broader so what happens is the condyles have to sit horizontally over the tibial plateau because of the broader pelvis in order to head to accommodate in the acetabulum what happens is head has to tilt the neck has to tilt little lesser so less obtuse angle that uh, shaft of the female female femur also has to tilt somewhat uh, outer bending will be there similarly because of this uh, this uh, angle of shaft with the condyle also lesser 
it is since it is pulled more laterally. 